Today's reading is from Revelation chapter 5. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power for ever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Sandra. Right, who's looking forward to my seven hour sermon on the end times? Oh, well, well, four of you. I thought it would just be the, uh, the water, but we've got Bridget, Shusha, and Joel keyed on this. It, it's not actually a seven-hour sermon on the end times. Um, you also really need to pray for my voice. The number of people who've asked if I'm okay. I am okay. My spirit is very much okay, but this is my second cold in three weeks. And uh, if I start just doing this... <laughs> Start screaming what you used to scream when we were all on Zoom. Do you remember those days? You're on mute. Let's bring it back into the public sphere. Just pray, pray that my voice holds. So I want you to think back to the very, very beginning of um, our Kingdom series. At that point, we were looking at this verse when I opened. It wasn't actually the passage that we preached on, but this is what we looked at. Once, on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst, or within you, depending on translations. So you've got this idea that it's something quite hidden, those who have ears to hear will know what it is. Those who have eyes to see will know what it is. But we're not quite sure exactly how it can be observed. But the reason I picked this passage today to end this series on the kingdom is because we're leaping to the end of the book to hear this kind of story about the kingdom. See, we've just heard 
For you were slain, this is a voice that's crying this, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders and the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor honor and glory and blessing. Amen. So that is the end when it's the most visible thing in literally the universe. So is that just a future thing and at the moment it's a hidden thing, the it being the kingdom? Or as we'll look at later, is there a sense in which even though this is a future thing, is it also happening now? How can it be? How can this be that this is one of the many tensions we've been looking at in this series? We've looked at the upside down nature of the kingdom. We've looked at the way that growth works in the kingdom. We've looked at the way that it's contended against. We've looked at the very strange nature of it. It's ever emerging and it's an ever arriving kingdom. But how can it be that we have something that's both hidden and this glorious? Or how can we have something that seems to be a now and a not yet, if you've heard of that theology? The sense that in this part of Revelation, everything is happening at once. The king is exalted. Everybody in the kingdom knows who they are and who he is. And then we've also got this sense that now we don't feel like these things are happening on the earth. And yet we're seeing these tiny inbreaking moments. So how does it work? Well, friends, I have an exclusive insight for you this morning. I have exclusive mystery that has been revealed only to me about how they all work together. Okay, do you want to know? Do you want to know? I haven't got a clue. <laughs> okay. If you do have a clue about the kingdom of God, I would say you're probably doing it wrong as well. We don't know. It is a glorious mystery. And we have to be okay with mystery. We have to be okay with the way that God does things. But today I want to learn a little bit about the victorious kingdom that is certainly true at the end of the book. But I believe it is true now. And it is a time to see that time, this time, the revelation time, in break into where we are now. But we need to pray. So let's do that. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Lord, thank you that that's heaven's song. Thank you that we've been looking this morning in this passage at even more of heaven's songs. And Lord, would you teach us what it truly means to sing those. To know that that's eternity. Declaring who you are, Jesus. And yet, and yet your kingdom is also here. And as we gather in this place, and as we go out even more importantly from this place, would we realize the wealth that sits in us as kingdom citizens? Would we know whose we are? Would we know what to do? And with fear and trembling, yes, Lord, but would we go out and share your kingdom truths with the world? In your precious name we pray. Amen. So I want to ask us questions this morning about being a kingdom family. And there's three of them, and hopefully we'll get on to all three. And the first question is, who's in it? Look around. Me. Oh, okay. Well, at least you're sure of your identity. There's always the one. You are in it, and you're in it. This is an incredibly unusual bunch of people. If you think about the rest of your work environments you are probably not in an environment anything like this. You're probably not saying, I'm of equal rank and equal worth to a child. Oh, but you are in the kingdom. You're probably not saying, we're working in an environment where it's quite so culturally diverse. But you are in the kingdom. With so many diverse interests, so many ways of expressing themselves, so many different backgrounds and opinions, If your church, or if your view of God, or if your view of Christianity has got only people that you agree with in it, or only people in the Conservative Party in it, if you're a Conservative, or only people in the Labour Party, if you're a Labour or anything else that's not a political statement, then it's probably going a little bit askew. If your Jesus looks like one end or the other and completely agrees with everything, if everyone that you worship with, if everyone that you talk to 
looks exactly like you, then how well are we building kingdom family? Let that be a prompt to us this morning that actually what we've just heard in here is a vision of eternity that includes what? Every tribe, every tongue, every nation. If we swipped over to seven, it's even clearer. I didn't read that one because it doesn't involve the word kingdom. But this is what Revelation 7 has to say about this great multitude. That no one would count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. For in Ephesians 2, it also talks about us being built together. People who weren't family becoming family. That's what the church is. So I want to provide a pretty harsh prompt to us this morning to think about how are we relating to those not like us here? Because before we can go out and model everything that the kingdom family ought to be to the world, we need to make sure that it's right in here. So when's the last time you didn't go to your default church clique? We all know you've got one. (laughs) Home groups are great. Meet your home group. Meet your team. But I challenge you in the coffee after this this morning, go and talk to someone you've never talked to before. Go and talk to the person that you think I've never, ever, ever think I would have anything in common with that person. But let's see what I have got. It starts with us realizing that a kingdom family is radically laid down family because we've all got this one thing in common. We think that this Jewish carpenter bloke was not a Jewish carpenter bloke, but he was the son of God and that he's alive and that he reigns and that is enough to hold us together. And when the world is fracturing over a million things, we have never seen such a divided population that's running after identity politics, that's running after, if you say this, you're dead to me, you're deplatformed, I can't possibly have anything in common with you anymore, you've upset me, you've not even upset me, but you've upset someone who's something to do with me. The world is leading us off a cliff. Soon I don't think we will be able to have relationships with anyone who isn't in our immediate family or our absolute best friend. And even then, what's friendship? Is friendship based only on those who 100% agree with us? Well, this has quite a lot to say about the fact that the wounds of a friend should be something that we want. People who know us intimately, people who will say, I don't think you did that right. I think you need to moderate your attitude. We can't even receive that correction in our own lives, friends. But let's learn by the power and the presence of God how to be a family that actually says, you have the right to speak into my life. I trust you. Now, don't, don't, don't run away with this and make it a safeguarding nightmare. You do not need to go and share your intimate secrets with any random person. That's not what we're calling you to do. We are calling you to welcome every random person. But you can find some. And by God's grace, we can learn what it is to build a covenant family together. Connections that matter. If you don't like them, tough. You're stuck with them for eternity. <laughs> but this is a huge reason why this church works. Because we as staff team have covenanted our lives together that we know that we don't just lead a church and clock off at five, but we realize that a kingdom family and a kingdom unity looks like lives laid down together. Sometimes that means far too many WhatsApps at 10 o'clock at night, but the point is, it's not just, I've done my 40 minutes here. I've done my hour and a half in church on Sunday. The kingdom, friends, is our whole lives, which is why this isn't a series on the church. It's a series on the kingdom. And I want you to note how the Bible begins and ends. It begins in a garden. In this case, it's a garden with half of London Zoo in it, but you know, the picture stands. But it ends in a city. Okay? Starts in a garden, ends in a city. What's the difference? Well, a garden is lovely and beautiful and they certainly walked with God in the cool of the day, but they weren't having to interact with others at that time. It was their life and it was their walk with God. And that was it. Unfortunately for the introverts, (laughs) you end up in a city. Now, do you have your own house or your own mansion or whatever? You know, that's a separate passage and not the sermon. But your eternity is not only with the beautiful one, 
the Lamb of Heaven, the reason there is no sun. But it is with other believers. It is with multitudes who do not look like you. It is with this bride from across the world, his beautiful South American bride, and his black bride, and his Chinese bride. And all the statistics right now, it's going to be quite a lot of Chinese people in heaven. And we praise God. I was actually having a conversation with someone this week. I'm not doing them any disservice. It was over an appointment, and they started asking me about heaven. So, woohoo, evangelism opportunity 101. And they said that their idea of heaven was individual separate islands in the clouds where you could do you and they could do them and you could occasionally meet if you wanted to but if you like cats you had cat island and if you had dogs you have dog island and never the two shall meet no 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 I mean it's a great inroad bless her for asking the question we praise God But heaven is a city. And there's also a new earth. And again, because this isn't a sermon on the end times, let's not go into that. The point of this is that kingdom family involves a lot more than just you, a lot more than just your opinions, a lot more than just your attitudes. And part of our being one, part of our demonstrating a radical oneness to the world that should be attractive It's our love for one another. It's our forgiveness for one another. What does the Bible say about how we should be known? By our love for one another. That's how you know them. So if you're struggling to build those relationships, then ask for the Spirit's help. There's power in breaking off past trauma in relationships that haven't worked out. I've had people from a very early age break my trust. I learned it at the age of six or seven in primary school. I learned how to shut down what I shared for a very, very long time. Even two weeks ago, God broke another part of that off me. So he can do that in your lives too, so that we start to yield to one another and become a family that we should be. And therefore, if there's something that's needed doing in church, you don't do it because we've nagged you for the 978th time. You do it because it is a joy to lay your life down in kingdom service. It's a joy to use the gifts that God has given you to serve others. It's a joy to realize that actually we don't just do the Western family family insular model and get on with the rest of our week, but that actually our lives belong to one another. If we did that, imagine the change. And that's only point one. Let's see the rest of them. Do you want me to stop there? I mean, that's a perfectly accurate sermon. What's our family DNA? If we read this, how do you know what your DNA is? Because you, meaning Jesus, were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. That's your DNA. You are blood bought. You are ransomed. You are paid for by the highest price imaginable by our Saviour. Well, at least Jesus is excited. Amen. Do we live like that? Do we realise that that same blood is flowing in the, in the person next to us? Or if it isn't because they don't know the Lord yet, are you excited to tell them that that is your family DNA? Because it's our family DNA. And so often we live like, okay, fine, we're saved. Fire insurance, if you want to call it that in an old time. You don't feel like you're going to hell. But then we're going to live the rest of our lives as we flipping well, please. But actually the story of kingdom life is that it's ever in breaking and you are ever growing in it. So yes, what is the sign of our acceptance into the kingdom and our family DNA is the seal, is the deposit of the Holy Spirit. But some of us are giving the Holy Spirit very little to do in our bodies and he's getting quite bored. How are some of these for the songs that you'd like to sing? I surrender some. He's quite a bit to me. Take my life and let me be. When the saints go sneaking in, sit up, sit up for Jesus. A comfy mattress is our God. Self-esteem to the world, the Lord has come. Oh, for a couple of tongues to be bothered to sing. Wait, there's more. Praise God from whom all affirmations flow. My hope is built on nothing much. (laughs) Pillow of ages fluffed for me. I'm fairly certain that my Redeemer lives. 
What an acquaintance we have in Jesus. <laughs> Above average is thy faithfulness. We are milling around in the light of God. <laughs> And spirit of the living God falls somewhere near me, but not on me, somewhere near me. Please give the Holy Spirit something to do. He really wants out of you. And if any of, this is a joke, yes, but it's a joke with a serious point. Your life should look different from the world. Now, because I'm a historian, you get all the fun history. Woohoo! This is the second century. Uh, we don't know exactly when. There's only one fragmentary copy of it, so it's very hard to date. Uh, the letters of Diogenes and chapter five. So very early on in the Christian story, only a hundred years max after the Christians began and set up their churches, they have begin begun to influence society. Now, in this, I just want to give it a slight warning and say, when it's talking about marriage and when it's talking about children, he is not saying that is something Christians must do. Paul, and indeed Jesus himself, was single. He's not talking about must get married. He's just saying, in this case, like the Christians didn't look any different from any other part of society. Okay? So just with that warning, this is what he had to say in the second century. The distinction between Christians and other men does not lie in country or language or customs. They follow local customs in clothing, food, and the rest of life. And yet they exhibit this wonderful nature of their own citizenship. They live in their own countries, but as if they were resident aliens. They share all things as citizens, and yet endure all things as if they were an underclass. Every foreign country is their homeland, and every homeland a foreign country. They marry like everyone else and have children, but do not destroy their young. They keep a common table, but not a common bed. They live in the world, but not in a worldly way. They enjoy a full life on earth, but their citizenship is in heaven. They obey the appointed laws, but they surpass the laws in their own lifestyle. They love everyone and are universally derided. They are unknown and roundly criticized. They are put to death and gain life. They are poor, but make many rich. They lack all things and yet have all things in abundance. They are dishonored and are glorified in their dishonor. They are abused and they call down blessings in return. When they do good, they are beaten up as ne'er-do-wells. When they are beaten up, they rejoice as men who are given a new life. In short, what the soul is in the body, the Christians are in the world. The soul lives in the body, but is not confined by the body. And the Christians live in the world, but are not confined by the world. God has appointed them to this great calling, and it would be wrong for them to decline it. Is that us? Awkward silence. Is that us? I've not always got that right. I've not always thought, okay, right, someone's got really, really cross with me, or come against me. How could I work out how to bless this person? Although, by God's grace, I am getting better at that. But is this the lifestyle we model? So distinctively that even in less than 100 years after Jesus had died and resurrected and ascended, they were able to write that about Christians. Now, yes, this person had clearly become a Christian and was praising this lifestyle, so it is taken from a certain point of view. But look at that radical life. Look at those things. Does our DNA match up to that? What thing in there challenged you to say, I realize that I have not demonstrated that? The good news is there's forgiveness. There's a new morning. There's a new start. But if we're asking what our DNA is, it should be recognizable. It should be noticeable to all those around us. So although, as individuals, we will not get this right every single day until the day we die. But as a church, and that's why point one had to come before point two, as a collective, there should be enough of us able to demonstrate to the world a radically different way of living. 
And I checked. I checked in here. I thought I'd better go back to the Greek. We've got a visitor in the second service who might like to know that I did learn something from theological college. So I did go back to the Greek to just check it here. And it is not a kingdom of priests. It is, in the Greek, a kingdom and priests. So we are not just called to do a priestly office now and for all of eternity. We are called to be a kingdom and priests. So we have the nature of being a priest. We know that in scriptures our highest calling. We all are. We all want to offer our whole lives laid down as sacrifices to the Lord. But we are also a kingdom. And that means that we have a responsibility to live differently in all areas. Not just in our worshipping life, in our private prayer room on Sunday mornings, the bit that nobody sees. If it said kingdom of priests, you might have got on away with that. But no, do you hear what I'm saying? The Greek says, firstly, kingdom. So your kingdom, you are forming a kingdom on this earth right now. And a kingdom has many facets to it. It has an arm that's going to be about social justice. It has an arm that's going to be about prayer. It has an arm that is very much going to be about freedom. It has an arm that is going to be about as many of the gifts as the Lord has put in your heart to release to the world. So I want you to wake up tomorrow morning. It's a bit late now, but tomorrow morning, wake up and realize whose you are and what your job is, which is to demonstrate a different kind of kingdom. Our second sermon was asking, who is the king? Does your life demonstrate every day that you know the king? And does our collective life demonstrate how we're building a kingdom, a different reality that has different rules, where we don't lie, where we champion the other, where we lift up those who are broken, where healing can be found, where we empower the most li- least likely and the most likely to do further and better things in the kingdom of God. All of these values should be contrary to those of the world. People should be looking at our lives and saying, what kingdom do you belong to? That's not a value of the United Kingdom. We don't do that. What on earth do you do? Who on earth do you believe in? That that's the kingdom that you represent. Which leads me on to my third point. What does it look like to reign? This is another contentious part in the Greek. Is it uh, they will reign in verse 10? Some say they shall reign, and other manuscripts say reign. So it's not a future thing, it's a reign now. And yes, I think there's a difference, and I think that there is a future form of this that we will learn about only in heaven. How can our human minds even understand the multitude of angels, the myriad angels? It's running out of words to describe them. So there is a future that we can't quite understand to talk about. But we do understand now. We might not be very good at now and all of the things that press in on us and crush us, but I believe that it is actually scriptural to say that we start that reign now. So you are people of a different world now. You are people of a different kingdom now. And I want us to look different from the world. I want us to start working out what it says in the book of Romans, for example, about reigning in life. Now, Don't get me wrong. Does reigning in life mean every day is fantastic? No one ever oppresses you anymore. Everything is going swimmingly. Thank you, Jesus. My life looks so hashtag blessed. No. In fact, indeed, if you pursue this stuff, chances are you're going to face a shed load more persecution. So it's not about are you happy and just swimming off the surface of life? Isn't it wonderful? Reigning is a different thing. Reigning is a certainty and an authority and a power that you know is not yours. That you know that you are fragile and broken human, be- human beings who things happen to, things will bash you down. But yet when you're back in that place with the Lord, you realize your sonship is real. You're, and I'm not saying that as a gender neutral thing. I'm saying that it is a position. It's not daughtership, sonship. Daughters are also sons too, if you can get your heads around that. Sonship is a position, but you can call call it daughtership if that helps you. That is the truth of who you are. But so many of us are living a life that is not yet reigning because we don't realize that. We don't know whose we are. 
And in some ways, we feel that our life can often go a little bit like this meme. This is the one for associate pastors. Who saw all of this? You know, there was a long series of these about five years ago, what people think I do. So this is, oh, this is one for Joel or for Dave. Right, maybe for me, you can insert the word bishop. That'll be fun, won't it? So who saw these? What my mum thinks I do, what the youth think I do, what seniors think I do, what my pastor thinks I do, what I think I do, what I really do just look a little bit lame, but we all think we stand here and just, we're so holy, we're amazing. The youth think I'm 85, the seniors think I'm 12. Uh, you sleep for the whole job, obviously, because I only work Sundays, and um, I'm not sure what mum thinks I'm doing up there, leading a massive praise band, I think. But the visions of what we are get very, very skewed, don't they? But what I want us to focus on for this empire is our kingdom of authority and our freedom. And when we reign, we've got a message to offer to the world. Not that we've never had a problem, but that in our problems, we've found the Lord. And far too much of the Western church right now doesn't have a clue what it looks like to reign. It only has a grid for I turn up on Sunday and I do the churchy thing, and then I go back, and depressingly to the world, and to yourself, and to the delight of the devil, your life looks exactly the same as everybody else's life. And why is that? It's because we are not fully aware of whose we are, and the authority that we have. Okay, now that is not condemnation. Do not hear condemnation from me, because I know just how broken I am. All the best bits of me are Jesus, and that's all there is to it. We are not fully aware, and maybe we won't be until eternity. But this morning, I want us to wake up to the fact that if you're living in habitual sin and you think that you can't break it, that is not your portion. If you think that you are constantly going to be held in cycles of X, Y, or Z, whatever it is, that is also not your portion. Why have we built a church that likes people to stay the same every single Sunday rather than being healed up, trained up, and sent out to fight the spiritual battle? Because the enemy doesn't like it when we realize that the spiritual battle starts here. And the spiritual battle starts in us. So in no way do I take away from the pain that you are going through or that you are walking through. But part of our shared DNA is bringing change on the earth. But that change starts here. That change starts with you and with me, with all of us, building a different reality. I don't think I've actually got time to go into my next few slides. But I want to end with the conclusions for us from all of this. So I'm back to the first point. I want us to come into greater family alignment. All of you, that's all of you. Start off with an easy one. We've got to bring and share lunch next Sunday. Come along, even if you're in this congregation and you've got to come back. What have you got to lose? Yes, you could go and do something with your family, but what if that we realise this week for the first time? This is our family. Getting to know others who are not like us is one of the greatest joys that we have and we can demonstrate to the world. And right up to those who are serving in other jobs. If you see a need, come and serve. That's family. We lay our lives down for one another. Secondly, know your DNA. Live as if you were blood brought at a price because you were. The Holy Spirit in you is just waiting to be able to reveal a greater level of freedom to you and who you are. If you're still living the same way now as you were living 10 years ago when you became a Christian, 20 years when you became a Christian, then might I humbly say that that's not the way it was meant to be. You are meant to grow. You are meant to look different even this, this week as you did from last week. But certainly at the end of the year, you should be able to look back and say, I can't believe Jesus, I had lived without that truth. Thank you that this is the year you revealed that truth to me. What on earth are you going to reveal to me next year? This is crazy. But if you were bought at a price, which you were, do you live with that realisation every single day? Do you wake up and think, I'm not just 
Mary or Bill or whoever I am. I'm a son. I'm a daughter of the living King of Kings. I realize that his blood through, flows through my veins. I realize that there'll be a time at the end of time, but why not start now, where we are declaring these things together, saying, you purchased me, God. You purchased me at the death of your own son on the cross. You purchased me. We should wake up with that realization. And that should be exciting every single day. So live like that. Live like it's the most precious thing to you in the world. Do you know what the first thing is you do when you wake up, but it's normally pretty telling? Do you reach for your phone? What do you do? What about if you lived with that reality every morning? Because it's true, but you need to recognize it. And lastly, know that the most unlikely people are called to demonstrate the kingdom, and that is you. So yes, God uses all sorts of people, but if you disqualify yourself for any reason, or have disqualified yourself. Not to say that you're not in a season where you're being healed right now and you need to wait. But even in that, you have a testimony. God is building a testimony. Actually, the people who should be on platforms are not those who know it all and have it all put together and had a perfect life and already had the Harvard degree in public communication. The people who should be on the platform and the people who are speaking to you and the people who are speaking out there should be people who have got a testimony, however quietly you feel you can whisper it, of what God has done. If we want to see the kingdom inbreaking, it takes us realizing this DNA. And also when things go wrong, because of course they do. Of course they do. Even when we realize our authority, things go wrong. Then you come back to what? Jesus, yes. But you come back to a safe family. You come back to a family that you know you can champion and that knows champions you. That if you've mucked up, if you've said something stupid, if you've gone wrong in your life, if these things have happened, I want, one of my goals for this church is for every single member of it to come back and know this is a safe place. You feel far safer trying something out when you know there's people who will champion you here. No judgment, no humiliation, no condemnation, just love and life and praying for you to be able to do that thing again. That's a weaponization of the kingdom that needs to happen to change out there. So that's why this sermon matters. You might think it's a funny one to end on. Like, why are we doing family now? Because building up a safe family who knows where they are, whose they are, how safe they are, enables you to go out there and demonstrate the kingdom. Amen? Amen. Okay. So for these two slides, the second part is the same. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't change. But I want us to stand in a second. Um, the bit in the black, the black and white, changes. And I want us to read that out because basically what I've done is I've picked from this passage the three hymns of praise, the three things we're going to be singing for eternity because things change when we worship, right? Strongholds are broken when we worship. Attitudes come into alignment with the alignment that they should be coming into. And we get to break off some of the things that we've been talking about as we praise and as we worship. So the right again, once again, the right-hand side won't change, just the left-hand side. I'm going to say that together. So would you please stand? Say together. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and we will reign on the earth. Keep going. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Stay standing because we're going to do that last bit. This is the brief of how all of this works and how all this comes down. That we fall down and we worship. So my job is to prepare you for an ever-arriving kingdom in our midst. Yes, to lead a church and all of that. 
but I pray that you also know, you know that your job, in whichever circle of influence you have, is to prepare people for meeting Jesus in an ever-arriving kingdom in your midst, based on whose you are. Let's pray.